How the heck are you? I'm bloody marvellous. That's I've got good. a special anniversary tomorrow. What's that one? One year I've booed. Oh my goodness, that is amazing. Well done. Bad thing. It was good. <laughs> wow. I think this one, I think it's like a bone graft. I think this one's taken. <laughs> <laughs> Everything's going to be okay. <laughs> That's so good. I actually should introduce um, my special guest today. I'm chatting to the one and only award-winning comedian and 2018 I'm a Slip League Get Me Out of Here winner, Fiona O'Loughlin. Uh, great to have you on Legends of Bevo for a chat. Uh, thanks, Bevo. Good to be here. Welcome to Legends with Bevo. Thanks to Anytime Fitness Glenel. But how have you been going this year? Obviously, we'll talk about your book in a moment, but what else have you been doing to keep yourself busy in this weird COVID year? Well, I've been um, living differently uh, because <laughs> I've never been so cash poor in my life. So that was interesting. Um, not having any gigs, therefore not having any money. <laughs> oh. And it was quite, because I've been through quite a lot, well, I've put myself through quite a lot. I've loved COVID. I thought, oh, no, that sounds shocking. I've loved it. Well, lucky <laughs> you, you know. Um, but it, I just thought, look, take this opportunity now. You're never going to get a time like this again to really enjoy the time off, you know, and I did. I um, live in a little apartment in Adelaide and, um, yeah, I wrote a book as well. <laughs> <laughs> I've done a lot of couch surfing. Well, channel surfing on my couch, yeah. So your new book is just... Sounds very interesting, Fiona. Um, and truth from an unreliable witness. <laughs> yeah. The, the title itself sounds very interesting. Um, obviously, you don't want to give too much away because you want people to go out and buy the book. But give us a bit of a a bit of a spiel what it's all about. Well, it's the story of living a life um, with undiagnosed alcoholism for ten years, and then and then pretty much the fifteen years it took me to. Uh, to get out of that hell and it was a hell it was you know addicts live in in a it's a terrible state to live in and i was so happy to write the book because i was on the other side of it and i really wanted it to be a light you know for other people anyone who's yeah that's what that's i kind of wrote it to explain myself to my loved ones that's what memoirs are uh, for <laughs> and yeah, to be of some use there's a warning yeah. on the book, and I do tell people they need to sit down for it. <laughs> <laughs> it's a wonderful story that you've been able to go from such a dark place into now a happy place. Um, how did you actually do it, though, Fiona? Like, is there anyone out there that you've wanted to give a plug to that has helped turn your life around? Oh, um, yeah, my manager, Sue Underwood. She was <laughs> the first person, really, that I came across who... And she didn't start out as my manager. I met her when I was homeless. And um, she lived near the place I was living in. I was in a pretty bad state. And we became we formed a friendship and she looked out, she looked after me at a time when I really needed somebody. And we really connected. And years afterwards, or four years afterwards, we reconnected and I asked her to have a look at my books. <laughs> <laughs> they weren't good. And she started out as my bookkeeper and, and it, things just got better and better because I finally had a person that I decided to be completely honest with and say, you know, I've had, I'd had so many managers and God bless them. Some of them were shonks, some of them were great people, but very hard to manage an active alcoholic. <laughs> and <laughs> so it took me on and I, we really haven't looked back. It was a partnership. And I'd say that. If there's anyone out there, you know, struggling with alcoholism, just, just go to the person you most rely on in your life, you know? Wonderful advice. Yeah. yeah. Whoever that may be, have a think about it. Could be an auntie, uncle, cousin. It doesn't have to always be, your, you know, your partner or your – but you've got to tell someone. That's where you start. Yeah, wonderful advice and – um, a credit to yourself and and Sue for for turning things around, Fiona. Um, and let's get back to your comedy now because um, we've spoken about the serious side of Fiona O'Loughlin, but there's definitely a lighter side to you as well. And when did the passion for comedy begin? And and you know what do you love most about being a comedian? Well, 
my earliest memories of sitting around the kitchen table loving it when mum and dad had friends come over, particularly funny ones. And my ears would be very intently listening to stories. I love stories. And I could even, I, would be, I wrote about it in the book, I was about as young as eight. And I could tell when someone was going to bugger up their story. I'm like, oh, she stuffed that up. She should have put that bit there and that bit there. It was very weird. But I was always attracted to funny, you know, because I found life to be quite a boring and dull place to be growing up in country South Australia. <laughs> but I, I was forever looking for the laugh, you know, and what a career. To, it's an incredible thing to find a career where you get to, what do you, what, just talk for an hour and that's your job. Everybody <laughs> shut up and listen to me. Fun. And where's the material come from? Oh, it's, it, I've never written a joke in my life. I, it just, it just, the world just, you know, just pay attention. And life's funny as heck. Everyone's life is. It depends how important it is to you, I guess. It's very important. <laughs> <laughs> well, I must admit, um, I've done some interesting things in my time, Fiona. I've, I'm a currently a pub trivia host and it was before, before the COVID situation anyway. And, um, I've also been an art drawing model where you're basically standing nude in front of oh, a, 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 bunch of, a bunch of people just drawing you. Um, but I must admit, being a stand-up comedian would be one of the most terrifying things. Um, you know, like I, I find the other stuff so easy. You know, has there been a time where you've been really nervous in front of a group of people? Maybe your very first gig was it was it sort of frightening being in front of a group of people knowing that they're just watching you? Yeah, it's. First thing you've got to do is take control of your actual body because it's so terrifying that very first time that you shake. Like you literally, I remember one of my legs, it was my first gig I ever did and it was in South Melbourne. But I remember that scene and it was most of the headliners in Melbourne at the time and this is late 1990s or early 1990s, but... I got up and they said, do you want to do 10? That's right. They knew that there was a territory comedian coming. They're expecting a six foot 10 truckie. And, um, <laughs> I turn up and I'm five foot nothing. And they said, are you the comic from Alice Springs? <laughs> and I didn't even, I really didn't have any good material. Um, but I, I remember standing on the stage and I remember one leg just shaking like it went off on its own tangent, like it had its life of its own. But all I remember is that they liked me. I don't remember getting great laughs, but I remember that feeling. And it's like going to the casino and you play blackjack and you win and you go back next week and you, you just want that feeling again. And I didn't get that feeling again for a long time. It takes a very, very long time to get good at stand-up, you know. It is actually a craft and you do need stage, you need stage time, you know, flying hours and it's taken me years, really, to transport the dinner party me. That's what I always wanted to do. I wanted to, I used to watch Billy Conley. I'd be like, oh, I want to do that, you know, where you, you're you just there telling a story like you would at a dinner party. And, and I remember getting to that. I, I kind of nearly got to that uh, level. But by then I was drinking so much. You know how Billy Conley used to tell one story, then that'd take him off on another story, and then that'd take him. But he'd yes. find his way home. But unfortunately, I didn't always find my way home. And people would say, God, you you didn't finish that story about meeting the Queen, or you didn't finish it. <laughs> but uh, even now, where I feel as comfortable as I've ever felt on stage, you never lose that nervous energy. But it doesn't debilitate me anymore. And what about hecklers? Because I've been to a number of comedy shows um, over the years and I love my comedy, especially at Fringe Time. You get to see some great comedians. Um, and I sort of see some, obviously, people have a fair amount to drink and they carry on. And I feel really sorry for the comedians. And sometimes, like, obviously, some of them deal with it better than others. Yeah. Um, how do you go with hecklers? And what's your sort of tactics? I don't really design my comedy for heckling. A lot of comics do because it's another bag of tricks. It's another trick in your bag of tricks, you know, to deal with hecklers. And I don't really play that instrument, you know. Um, I'm a storyteller, so heckling's weird. 
the only heckle I would get is if you if someone's really drunk. And because I'm I'm really not good at the comebacks. I don't like putting people down. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hate conflict. So if I get a heckle, if someone's heckling me, I just ignore it. I remember once I was doing um this, it's the most frightening gig a comic can do. And it's like having a um it's kind of like the Coliseum for stand-ups, and it's in Edinburgh. This show starts at midnight. Johnny Johnny Vegas calls it the equivalent of self-harm, you know, and it, it's in, yeah, as I said, it, it's, it starts at midnight. About 300 drunk Scottish people come in, and they come to this gig to heckle. That's the gig. like, And yeah. it's like the comedian tries to stay on stage as long as they can before they get booed off. So it's more like sport than, anyway, it's horrifying. And I did it one night and it ended up being quite a famous night and there was a documentary made about it, not because of me, because I was on with Russell Brand. And Russell Brand, he got so pissed off with the hector he threw a jug of beer at them. Oh, what? And, yeah, so it's glass flying everywhere. It's like madness. And there's 300 screaming Scottish people saying, get off, get off. And anyway, he's thrown a pint of glass into the audience, then pints are being thrown back. And Adam Hills was emceeing, and he said, our next guest is Fiona O'Loughlin, and I would have loved to have uh, got there quicker, but I couldn't because there's a whopping piece of glass oh. in my thigh, and I had to pull it out. Oh, shivers. And, and then go on stage. And it was, it was almost like, oh, what they'd done to Russell Brown too. They booed him off and then they gave him an encore. So that he came back down, he stomped back past me. I'm waiting to go on after him. He stomps back past me and they only ha- encored him to, be ha- to ha- boo him off stage again. <laughs> what? <laughs> that's, when, that's when all the glass started flying. Anyway, the story got bigger and better over the next couple of days. I was walking down the Royal Mile, which is the heart of Edinburgh, and this stranger came up to me and he said, are you the girl that was stabbed at Leighton Life? <laughs> I said, yes, that was me. <laughs> what a story. So I, I actually have a scar on my leg from Russell Brand, which is I polish it every day. That's, a, that's one heck of a story there, Fiona. I wish the scar was better. It's not really good. It's only that big. <laughs> and I'll tell you who was in the audience. The Umbilical Brothers were in the audience. Oh, how good. And they'd seen this horror show of the Russell Brand fiasco and they're like, oh, God, this is awful. You know, who's next? And then Adam Hill said, our next guest is an Australian comic and the Umbies just hugged each other and they couldn't look. They were so scared. <laughs> anyway, we all live to tell the tale. Exactly, and you've, you've gone and through some great things. I mentioned before the award-winning comedian, that's for sure. Now, 2018, speaking of award-winning, you won the I'm a Celebrity Get Me Out of Here show in 2018. Fiona, what was that experience like and, and the feeling of winning that particular show? It was very surreal winning it. Like, I... I said yes to that show basically because I needed the money, you know. (laughs) I wasn't long out of rehab and I was cash poor. Anyway, I did the show, but I just thought, look, if I can get, if I don't make an ass of myself and last at least two weeks, it'll get me some exposure so I'll sell more tickets to my shows. That's pretty much all I went in thinking. And it was so funny, while we were in there, no one in there, even though we all got on, and I love just about everyone except Jackie uh, Gillies. She's a pain in the ass. <laughs> <laughs> but even while we were doing the show, they all just presumed I was the lamest duck. I remember Josh Gibson. I said, who do you think's the top five? And he'd go, oh, me, Nolsey, Dasha. Everyone would have their top five. And I was never in anyone's top that's what makes it even better. And then it just got weirder and weirder and more people kept going. And then all of a sudden we're down to three. And that was that's when I felt I'd won, you know, because it doesn't matter. You're down to the final three. And then when I bloody won the thing, I, I still can't believe it happened. Yeah. 
And what were some of the challenges like? Because we see them on TV and some of them are quite scary. Um, were there any where you sort of got, I guess, taken out of your comfort zone, Fiona? I think the hardest, and it looked it actually looked funny, but it was Pete Roselon and I um, herding goats in 40 degree heat and it was brutal because they got it. It was just one of those fun bits that they use for filler, really. It's not really a challenge. What was it called? A try? Yeah, no, it was a challenge. The trials are where you get a star. The challenge is just something fun and stupid. Anyway, so Peter and I had to go and herd goats. <laughs> They've got to get the right camera shot, and it took four hours in the sun. And I'm not an active person. Like I, yeah, I don't need my limbs really for much at all. I, <laughs> Four hours That's in the sun, hard, yeah, hard day. that would have been rough. Hmm. Yeah, because I had to pick a goat up, and they're really stubborn goats. Yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> I'm just remembering it now, pulling this ram by the horns, bizarre. And who are you closest to on the show? Like, who did you build up real relationships with? Uh, Danny Green and Pete Rosethorn were my buddies. Yeah, and Josh Gibson and um, Simone Holtznagel. Who was the beautiful model? Yes, I remember her. Yeah, yeah. She barely got any um, screen time because she's a Wollongong girl and she's got a mouth like a sailor, and so they could barely. She'd do a great piece, and then she, then she'd end it with a "See you on Tuesday." Oh no! <laughs> Sounds like she'd be a good stand-up comedian, Fiona. It wouldn't be bad. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> hey, before I let you go. Um, What's what's happening in the future now for Fiona O'Loughlin in 2021? Um, let's forget about COVID let, because obviously we want to yeah. move forward and let's hope, fingers crossed and toes crossed, everything crossed that next year is a great year for all of us. But um, what's going to happen? Obviously, we've got the Fringe happening early in February in Adelaide. Uh, what else is, what else is um, going forward for Fiona O'Loughlin? Well, I'm launching my book at the Festival Theatre in January, uh, doing a show and then I guess it's fringe and touring. Hopefully, get back to Edinburgh. Um, yeah, the world's my oyster. See, I've done all the work. All the hard work's done. Love it. I've raised five kids. I've kicked my booze. All I have to do now is get old and annoy people. <laughs> well, I look forward to to watching one of your shows next year at the Fringe, or getting there in January when you do the the book launch. And um, who's your must see every year? Who do you see? Uh, who's who's my must see? Um, that's a good question. I like seeing different comedians. Um, last year I saw Tom Ballard for the very first time and actually He's great, isn't he? He's great. And actually, this just shows how nice he is. He actually gave me the, the time of day to actually have an interview that same that same week for Legends of Bevo, which is really cool. So Fantastic. Yeah, so he was really fun. Um the same as Harley Breen. I interviewed him a couple of years ago and then the same time. Oh, he's on, a legend. He's yeah. a legend. He's so funny. And then you know, gave me the time of day as well and had a couple of beers with him after the, the interview and and then watched his show that same night and, you know, caught up with him after the show. And he's a great fella. So, yeah, there's just so many great comedians. Um, it's really hard to answer that one because I just like seeing all different things, to be honest. That just makes me smile thinking of Harley Breen. So many of us, so many Australian comedians yeah, are such tight friends because it's such a rare thing to do. You know, it's not many people do it and... I think because we have this crazy bond, because we all know where we started. We all know. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I remember Harley employing my daughter as his nanny. Oh, what? Yeah, God, he was funny. He said, well, she'd be great, wouldn't she? You raised her. She, she'd know how to get everyone's breakfast and get them off to school. <laughs> <laughs> That's a bit rough. <laughs> hey, this has been an absolute pleasure having you on Legends of Bevo, Fiona. We look forward to chatting again in the future. Your book, Truths from an Unreliable Witness. I look forward to reading it. And everyone out there watching or listening today, go out and buy yourself a copy. I'm sure it's going to be a great one, a great read. Thanks, Bevo. <laughs> Sounds so good. Sounds so good.